All right. So welcome everyone again from my side and in the name of the whole CSC289 on treatment expectation. Uh, we are very much looking forward to today's webinar speaker to, uh, to the session today. This is going to be Ben Seymour from the University of Oxford. I'm pleased to uh, introduce Professor Ben Seymour from Oxford University on behalf of the um, early career researchers uh, from the CLC. Um, he's a welcome senior clinical fellow working at the forefront of pain neuroscience, so very close uh, to our CRC topics. And his research spans from theoretical models and also experimental methods aiming at understanding and treating pain. Uh, additionally, he's a visiting researcher at ATR Labs in Kyoto and a fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, focusing on safe AI control systems. And today he will share his insights on a control model of pain. So please um, join me in welcoming Professor Ben Seymour. Uh, warm online applause. And I hand over to you. Right, right. Well, yes, thanks very much for the kind inv invitation and for um, inviting me. And what I'm going to try to do is leave you at the end of this um, talk with a kind of hopefully um, or possibly a different perspective on, on fundamentally what pain is and how we think about it um, in a couple of respects. So I'm going to start by um, trying to think of, take a broad perspective on pain. I mean, we often, you know, pain meetings often start with clinical um, impact um, statements and da epidemiological data. Um, but that was never what certainly never what attracted me to pain. I, I always thought the pain was a fa fascinating brain system and a real key to understanding why we have a brain and why we have a mind and why we feel and so on. Um, and at the heart of that is, is when you think about um, how important pain is and nociception is um, um, through evolution. If you think about like, you know, when in our history, when we were just like little single cell organisms, um, you know, in a, in a primordial soup, um, you know, just kind of moving around, they really didn't have to, you didn't have to worry about much in life, but you had to, you know, the main thing you had to worry about was, um, was damage and damage came in three forms really. So you could have thermal damage, mechanical damage, or kind of chemical damage. And it's remarkable to think that those, you know, still we have the, the kind of receptors for those three types of damage, you know, as a fundamental basis for the, you know, to, for the peripheral physiology, the nerve, the pain system, even now. So it's highly conserved and it's parallel, parallelly evolved in different species and organisms, all the way through up to the to the apparatus for nociception. So whilst, um, you know, so whilst, um, you know, getting food and resources and nutrients is important, there's nothing that kills you as quickly as pain. And that's really the kind of most important thing you would have to worry about really throughout the whole of our um, evolution. Um, and, you know, when you think about the origin of phenomenal consciousness, I mean, qu questions about consciousness are usually like, oh, what animals do we think are consciousness apart from apart from humans? But actually, I think a more interesting question is, um, you know, whatever point we evolved consciousness um, uh, in our evolutionary history, what was actually the first thing we became conscious of? What was the very, you know, what was that first glimmer or spark of consciousness? Uh, and I would argue, and I would argue, um, um, at length that it was very likely to be pain. Um, it really is the, the, the most salient thing that we feel as, um, um, as humans. And it seems to tap into something fundamental in our human consciousness, plays a key role in many types of behavior from initiation rites to religious rituals and, um, um, and so on. And I think there's something about the fact that, you know, pain is, is both immediate in time and it occurs somewhere on our on our body as we are as embodied creatures um, and there's nothing else that really binds you to you know the the present and to your body quite in the same way that, that pain does and that's fundamental for the, how we think about consciousness but of course it's a bit of a mystery in Penfield when he searched you know the cortex in awake epilepsy patient stimulating it to try to map brain functions somewhat struggled to find um, a pain cortex um, and that, of course, has led to a huge debate about exactly how pain is represented in the brain and sits at the heart of that fundamental question, you know, what is what bit of neural activity is actually necessary and sufficient um, for the, you know, for the subjective experience of pain. So it's fascinating in philosophy. And we often forget that as clinicians because we get so tied up with our patients and, um, and, and the problem. But 
Um, you know, it's always important to remember that it's, you know, it's a far bigger question, a fundamental question for, for brain science. As you might have guessed, this is, you know, I adopt an engineering perspective to this because I think it's really informative and really helps us understand how to or certainly provide a route to understanding, you know, the, 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 this core problem that we can't seem to find pain in the brain and we don't really know how it's structured or organised. Um, pain is, is fundamentally important for self-preservation or, or autonomy. And of course, that's particularly true for embodied systems. When your autonomous system is, you know, when the kind of computer hardware exists within the thing you're trying to protect in in uh, in the first place, so I always ask myself, um, you know, if you had to, if you're in charge of, you know, designing a new generation of robots to go to the moon or to um, to go off to some far flung part of the planet, um, how would you, you know, how would you design a pain system to help protect it? I mean, we'd all agree that it's probably useful to have a pain system. We know that pain is valuable. But how would you actually design that? Um, and the engineering perspective is also useful because it in, illustrates, you know, um, you know, raises the question of what it really means to understand the answer to that question. So what what does it mean to understand what pain is? Um, you know, we often, um, often in imaging, we, we talk about you know, this brain area is involved, but that doesn't really tell us what it is. Um, and it captures this, you know, the idea of what I cannot create, I do not understand, the Feynman quote, but also the idea that we can think about pain both in terms of what it does in terms of information processing, but also um, how that is actually implemented in, in the brain. So mapping all the way from, from what information is being passed between different brain areas and circuits and neurons and so on, all the way up to behaviour. Um, so I guess most of you are familiar with, with, uh, uh, you know, with pain, and this is maybe this is a um, a trivial slide for you but I suppose if I you know I, I thought we're making this slide how I could map the history of thinking there's much more to the history of pain than this of course but I think some highlights for me are the is Melzack's tripartite model because this captures the complexity of pain but also the fact that it's not just random complexity you know there are these clear components to you know dimensions to pain in terms of the you know um, sensory and affective and cognitive bits to it um Bud Craig's homeostatic model is in, you know, in enormously influential, way beyond just purely the um, concept of pain. Um, and thinking about it as an inter interoceptor sensory system, so this is a, a system which has inherent motivational value um, and captures the physiological condition of the body. And of course, Bud Craig went on to you know, use this idea to develop his theories of consciousness and you know, based on the insula primarily. Um, the motivation decision model is 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 um, it's sort of attributed to Howard Fields and what Howard Fields I think is you know the the, the key things that he recognized are pain important for learning and particularly as a sort of motivational signal and is centered around prediction so it's about pain is about telling you that you're going to get damaged not just about responding to damage that's just happened and of course the key part of that was the discoveries that he was involved in in, in understanding the anatomy of the endogenous control system that pain can modulate itself so part of that decision um, structure if you like part of the decisions that the pain system would be making is not just directing actions but also how it can modulate its own input um, and that's a really interesting aspect of the pain system and not something that you really think about when you think about other sensory systems um, and following on from that um, I mentioned a predictive coding model so this is really and of course Christian Buchel and um, his, um, and others and us have you know, been proposing that um, the kind of Bayes and brain might be a good way of thinking about aspects of, of pain. Now that's a very gen, very, uh, the, the concept of the Bayes and brain is very general, um, but it taps into the, you know, the idea that you know, pain seems to be something like a statistical inference about the causes of a, of a nociceptive input. Um, and that's quite nice because it explains, seemingly explains lots of aspects of things like placebos and nocebos, expectancy effects, um, um, and so on. Okay, so at the heart of any engineering or control type approach is, is thinking about what is the function of pain in the first place. And, you know, we, are, we, we all recognise that, you know, there's kind of good pain and bad pain. And a good pain is the pain that protects you against getting hurt. So if you touch this hot stove here, of course, you're going to immediately pull your hand away, um, uh, you know, and ouch. <laughs> um, and Obviously, the fact that we have a pain system, that, that's very useful. It, it drives that withdrawal. Um, but in fact, you probably withdraw your hand before you even feel the pain. Um, and 
when you really think about what you know what's the powerful bit of the paint system in this you realize that it's not so much the the, the immediate burn it's the fact that you don't touch it again so the next you know 10 or 100 or 500 times you see a red hot stove you don't touch it and you don't get burned so whereas um you know that immediate pain response um that immediate owl um saved you maybe getting a nasty burn it's the learning part the avoidance part which saves you getting 500 burns or however many and then when you think well okay what would have driven the evolution of the pain system you can see that in fact it's the, it's the learning part which is really the powerful bit that's what shapes your behavior that's what make, keeps you safe in the long run uh, and that's i think that's really a fundamental that's a really important point um um to recognize particularly when you think about how it's going to be organized in the brain if that is in fact where the evolutionary selective pressure may be kind of most dominant. Okay, so let's, this is just a kind of toy example about, I'm not going to go into complex control theory maths um, uh, or anything like that, because it doesn't need to be complicated. Um, this is a toy problem when you think about um, the, the prediction problem. Um, so the, all these green dots here, these are like, imagine these are states. So they could be, you know, part, they could be parts of a room, they could be decision making any any decision making tree that you would go through so you might wander through life along these green dots and then suddenly you end up with pain um, and your problem is well what you know where was the bad decision where did i go wrong um, on that pathway because uh, you want to know how not to go down that pathway um, again so this is um um this is a simple kind of control problem and it illustrates something called the credit assignment problem and the, and the credit assignment means where do you assign the credit for going wrong where is, where is the node where the mistake was made? Um, and you can solve that in a very simple way um, using, uh, you know, it's called reinforcement learning, but it captures many ideas in experimental psychology, like the school of Wagner rules and avoidance learning and so on. And that idea is based on the concept of value. So the value of any state basically simply tells you how good or bad it is. So it's, like a, it's just like a scalar number, you say. Um, <clears throat> Um, so if you assign a value to each state, you know, to how, um, how good or bad it is, you can use those values to learn. Um, and the nice thing about reinforcement learning is that you can learn, you don't have to wait until you get to the pain every single time. You, all you have to do is compare the values of two subsequent states. So if you go from a good, um, from a good value to, a high, to, a, to something which has a bad value, you can learn that you've already made a mistake before kind of following through the reasons why that state was bad. And, and the difference, you know, as you move through a value, um, value to value is called a prediction error. And you can use that for learning. Um, so that if you can imagine here in this um, um, toy example here, that there's actually a reward up there, you can see that where you made a mistake. So if you carry on along that pathway from the start, you can get to the nice reward, but you can learn that value landscape, if you like, um, by you simply using these prediction errors. Um, so it's not, it's not kind of, it's a predict, it's an error between two sub subsequent predictions, not necessarily that getting the actual pain itself at the end of it. Uh, and that's good because it allows you to uh, essentially learn higher order or kind of sequential um, um, problems. And it solves that, that, that tricky credit assignment problem. And it's incredibly valuable. You can play computer games just using this algorithm. Um, that then led to the question, and this is the sort of first question I asked when I was setting out on my PhD um, 20 years ago now is, you know, does the brain use a kind of high order prediction error signal to learn about um, future pain? Um, and to do that, I look at a, uh, like a, a second order, so a simplest type of higher order conditioning paradigm, where different routes through these subsequent states, S1, S2, S3, S4 there, could lead to high pain or very low pain. Um, and, you know, if you get someone doing a task like this, you can then make a kind of use a simulation to make a prediction of what the prediction error would be all the way through, you know, a task to the 30 minutes. So you've got someone in a scanner for and see whether anywhere in the brain looked like it was behaving like a prediction error. And as you would have guessed from the picture, the ventral pertainment looks like it's doing a prediction error for pain. So that's nice because it provides a nice um, initial piece of evidence that the brain appears to be doing some sort of prediction error like learning some sort of reinforcement learning um, procedure to learn about future pain and use that for guiding, um, you know, um, guiding behavioral output, so responses. Um, um, and not in this case, because it's Pavlovian, but in the future we'll see um, guiding decisions. Another key um, finding is um, 
uh, related to uncertainty. And this is um, an early study we did um, um, with, with Wako Yoshida looked at what happens when you get uncertainty about the perception of pain, building and again on this phase in brain um, sort of model. Now it's important to say here because uncertainty is often misunderstood. There are many, many different types of uncertainty. Um, and it's important to look exactly in the context of what task you're looking at. There's no such thing as a general uncertainty signal for pain. It completely depends on the behavior and the task um, um, you're looking at. And I say that because there's a recent meta-analysis which suggested that uncertainty didn't modulate pain in any way. But in fact, that's exactly what you predict because it completely depends on, on, on the nature of the task. Um, so it seemed here that uncertainty would be increasing um, perceived pain. So that's the first finding. And then the second study, we can show that uncertainty increases the learning rate about pain. And that's exactly what you'd expect um, from any simple model, because if you're uncertain about potential pain, you want to pay attention to it and you want to you want to learn about it faster. Um, so in this context, uncertainty is like an attentional signal, um, it in increases the speed at which you learn about things and it increases their salience, that, if you like, increases their value. Um, so it seems like it's enhancing learning th um, through that effect. Now we've done a lot of experiments over the years looking at all different aspects of, um, of what you would call classical learning theory, the Pavlovian learning, instrumental learning, looking at pain, relief from tonic pain, condition suppression, devaluation, and so on, looking at action related learning, so escape and avoidance, exploration, exploitation, trade offs, um, cognitive decisions, and then looking at these different aspects of endogenous control. Um, expectation effects and these uncertainty and attention effects and, con and controllability. Um, and, you know, one of the key things about endogenous control is it seems to be behaving in a way which maximizes the value of the information um, for learning. And that is what an optimal agent um, would do. And over the time, we've been able to build what we think is a, a good kind of map of the architecture of the uh, of a kind of uh, a control hierarchy for pain, so architecture for pain system um, in the brain. Uh, and this is really thinking about the context of phasic pain. Um, <clears throat> so if you think about this big, you know, the big green boxes at the very lowest level, you have a, these basic reflex centers. And then the Pavlovian learning system um, kind of hijacks that those, those evolutionary acquired reflexes um, and adds on a kind of predictive learning system. So the, the responses you get in the context of Pavlovian responses are very similar, or at least utilize the machinery for generating the reflexes in the first place. And then built on top of that is instrumental learning. So things like avoidance learning, they're not separate from a Pavlovian learning. They exploit that Pav Pavlovian learning architecture and build on top of that to add in more flexible control of actions. Um, so we think about basic avoidance learning and habits and, um, um, and so on. And there are many ways in which you get interactions between the state and the action-based um, controllers for that. But then, of course, we recognize that humans do all sorts of clever things um, and thinking related things to pain, so one-shot learning and, and, um, and planning um, um, and in catastrophizing. Um, and that's based on some sort of internal model of, the, of what pain is and, and what it does. And again, that exploits um, interactions with those lower, lower, lower levels of the hierarchy. Um, and all that maps to a kind of sensory hierarchy where you've got a nociceptive input going through sequences or stages of different um, levels of processing. And a key part of the actions, so the big green arrows going off to the left, is that they control not only things that occur in the outside world, um, but they also, it also control its own input through endogenous control. Um, <clears throat> so you can see there's quite a complex anatomy of a pain system there which maps to all these different types of responses and um, um, that you can get. Uh, but it does seem to capture at least a reasonable amount of, uh, of, of what we know about how people, you know, in actually this could be how animals respond um, to the, in, in the context of, of nociceptive and what we would call painful stimuli. Um, <clears throat> so one question then is, well, that's very, very good producing nice models. Can you use, you know, can you use these models to make do they do anything useful? Do they actually work if you put them in simulation? Um, and, and the answer is yes. And on the left there, you've got, a, we have a simple um, simulation task here. You've got to go from the, the green corner, the green square in the bottom left to the red square on the top right. And if it, every time you strike a wall, that gives you some level of damage, or some level of pain. So if you take a, a straightforward kind of um, control, pro, control algorithm approach to that, 
you'll quickly find your way to the um, to the target point, but you'll often pick up quite a lot of damage on the way, but often in early learning. So overall, you end up with the most efficient solution, but you usually pick up a bit of damage on the way. And in the pain system here, this is the max pain on the right hand side. And what you find is you're sl very slightly less efficient, but you're much, much safer if you have a separate architecture protective for pain, um, you have much, much less um, wall strikes. And you can formalize this. And it relates to a, something called what we call the safety efficiency dilemma, which is a special case of the exploration exploitation dilemma. And it really comes, how you, really comes down to how you explore early in learning um, to keep yourself safe. And that's particularly important if, if, um, if damage is accrued or if you can actually kill yourself um, from hurting yourself too much. So that's nice. And it's a nice example where you can use a brain inspired algorithm to, to come up with a reasonably good um, solution to a kind of um, um, a non-biological or conventional um, engineering control problem. You can make it more sophisticated in, in, in the simulation. So this is a static obstacle task here on the left and the right is a dynamic obstacle um, task. And you can, you know, we can... Um, depending on the way we define the states in action, you can do quite you know, quite clever um, uh, avoidance tasks and solve quite tricky problems um, with this. Um, and you can even extend it to a motor control context. Um, let's see if these work. Um, so um, this is very early in learning. You need to touch the green target where this is a two-limbed robot um, uh, and, and the, the blue thing is is painful, so you need to explore and solve this. This is using um, um, simulation software. And basically the bottom line is it still works quite well. There's different aspects to motor control than there are to what we would consider as decision, um, you know, um, um, uh, decision-making um, control, but, but these algorithms generalize quite well to different contexts. Um, <clears throat> Then that when you start building a kind of more sophisticated models of the pain system, you need a more sophisticated way to test them. Um, and we're currently looking at things like virtual reality as a way to capture um, much more the kind of free, freely movement, free operant type paradigms um, where we can start to test these models. Um, so, see if it, um, so this is using VR. So we built a um, this is a real time software interface where you gather all sorts of data. It could be EEG physiological recordings um, and you can see the picture of the jungle on the right is the in is the from the view of the person doing it and he's picking up fruit um, uh, this is using a v, uh, vr unity vr platform and you can do you can then do all sorts of different things so you can make the fruit painful so you can give um, you can do decision making paradigms where different fruit might cause pain which you can stick electrodes in a in a glove of the of the um of the of your um uh, vr system or you can do things like deliver pain over the back. So every time they bend over, they get back pain. Um, there's all sorts of um, things you can do. And what that then means is you need to um, um, develop the models to, to, to deal with these kind of free operant um, um, environments. So for us, this is a really um, important next stage in, in, in our experimental studies because we can really capture these far more kind of ecological situations where which are far more demanding and far more um, uh, closer to, to the actual types of problems that the pain system evolved to, to, um, to solve. That's also important because it helps us think about how we can eventually map some of this to patients. So this is my, um, this is my student, therefore you, know, you, can, you can see on the right here, we can track the motion. So you can, this is actually getting, you can do this in your own home um, and you can embed tasks. You can't send people home with pain stimulators, but if you're a patient and you get knee pain, for instance, we can measure many of the metrics and get people to do physio tasks um, in their own home. Um, so that kind of technology development is, is key as we kind of move um, forward in our, you know, trying to understand that computational architecture of the pain system. So what's a really important, uh, important point for me, I think it is this, which is when you look, reflect then on what, what pain looks like, um, you realize there are kind of two very different con um, concepts. So the, and the first, I think, which I think is a standard one, is a kind of sen as a sensory system, um, and and the idea there that pain is an optimal inference about the magnitude of a noxious. So this is kind of like a, a, a beginner level um, 
predictive coding type of approach. Um, so it's really, really trying to make an inference about the magnitude of an noxious event. So it's kind of like an object recognition problem. And when you think about endogenous control, then you realize that, you know, then they kind of, you, we argue that we have that, but um, you know, partly because of that inference problem, but in, in more generally speaking, pain will be modulated by anything that needs to be modulated to meet various demands. And critically, this is a retrospective approach. It's un trying to understand what happened that caused that pain to me. Um, what I will argue is that the you know this control approach um, um, suggests is different from that. It's a kind of motivation first view, um, and that is that pain kind of better understood as, a, as an optimal control signal as opposed to an optimal inference signal. That is directing your response to minimise current and, and future harm. Um, and what's important about that is when you realize if it's really a control signal then it's um then all that endogenous control is doing exactly what control system should do um and you know then you know you it doesn't make sense really to think about pain being modulated at all it's just doing what it's supposed to do um no susception is modulated but pain isn't modulated um it's just simply constructed in a way to optimize long-term benefit to survival um through learning and and that's a prospective so that's really not not based on what sh what you know what ha what just happened but what should i do now so that's a kind of forward looking um signal and why i like that view is because it we we all um kind of grow up with this idea that pain is this very you know subjective it's a bit variable it's modulated by loads of different things and that seems it, it doesn't seem right if you think about some, you know, I argue that pain is fundamentally important for the evolution of, of, of animals and so so important for our behaviour. Why would it be so variable and fuzzy and, um, and, um, and kind of seemingly unreliable? Um, <clears throat> and I think this view suggested, in fact, it isn't at all. In fact, it's a highly precise signal. It's just that what we had previously thought was kind of variability and fuzziness was actually pain doing what it's supposed to do. We just didn't realise what it was supposed to be doing. Um, and that makes more, far more sense evolutionarily, I think. Um, and it does also mean that it doesn't make sense to say that there's such a thing as the endogenous modular pain. Pain isn't modulated by anything. No susception, maybe, but pain isn't. Anyway, <clears throat> that's the view very much focused on phasic pain. So the short lasting, um, um, uh, definable response related um, events. But that doesn't seem to map so well to tonic pain, a persistent, long lasting pain you get at rest, um, which doesn't seem to have any um, uh, any rapid response. So it raises a question, can we really think about the tonic pain um, in a concept, in, 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 in the same sort of, um, in the same sort of way? Okay, this is a quiz. You've got, um, you've got two gates here, okay, trackway C and trackway J. And you've got to argue, you've got to guess what is the what is the problem? What is the difference with tra trackway J? So I'll give you three seconds to think about what the difference is and what that might mean. And you've got some imaging on, on the right. This is the answer. This is a velociraptor. Um, these are two different tracks. Um, and on the right there, you've got some fossils of velociraptor legs. Um, <clears throat> the, the lower one you can see is actually as asymmetrical. And that's the gait of an animal which is injured. Um, on the right, the, the fossil evidence shows, and this is actually occurs in something like five to 10% of fossils. Um, you'll see, a, I can't tell you where it is, but it's a, there is a healed fracture there. And the point of the significance of seeing a healed fracture is that what it means is that it was pretty common to get injured um, if you're a dinosaur. And in fact, that's the case of any animal. Injuries are common, they're always occurring. It's part of a normal life. Um, these are not chronic pain dinosaurs or anything, they're not, you know, queuing up outside the, the chronic pain clinic. It's just normal to get injured and injuries occur for many, many different re reasons. Here's another imaging. This looks a bit more human. See if you, anybody can spot the, anyone could spot the abnormality there. You've got two seconds for this. Okay, you have a fracture there at the top of that. I can't have a pointer, but the top bone, you can see it's fractured, it's splintered at the side. This is a trimalular fracture of the ankle. Um, and this was this was sustained in, a, in someone I um, um, a kind of PPI person who was roller roller uh, doing a roller derby. It's a really good way to get injured. Um, when I saw this, I decided to get some um, 
to, to kind of ask people who in a, um, uh, who have got fractures in, uh, who have had um, ankle fractures and um, via a roller derby um, club, which is a very good way to get people with ankle fractures because most of them seem to do it quite often. Um, and I asked them to keep diaries of how they felt after they'd injured themselves. So they get, of course, they felt pain, as you'd expect. But you also get all these other symptoms. They get frustrated and worried and tired and low motivation, drained, exhausted um, and so on. And these people are like they're superhumans. They're really happy and fit and healthy and young and active and sociable. And, you know, but if you fracture their ankles, they feel they, they start acting like patients. You know, they're fibromyalgia patients or something like that. Fatigue, lack of motivation, anxiety, low mood. Um, and they go on like that for a few weeks um, until they get better uh, and then go back, a, you know, a couple of months later, um, they're completely back to their normal self. So they go through this phase after they have an injury of this kind of suite of cognitive and, and behaviour. So just related to the to the previous talk about LPS induced injury, where you also get these illness types of behaviours, you get an injury as well. So pain is a cardinal feature, of course, but you also get these other other sorts of behaviours. Um, <clears throat> And you don't only see it in humans. This is um, this is obviously an octopus. It's an octopus with an injured tentacle. Um, and if you do ecological studies and ethological studies of animals um, uh, with injury, you see exactly the same sort of thing. If they get injured, they don't go out. They they um, they kind of behave as if they're anxious. Uh, they're much more worried about predators. Um, they don't explore, um, they lose a bit of appetite, they seem to behave in a tired and fatigued type of way. You can't ask the octopus how it's feeling, of course. Um, but the sorts of behaviours they display look very much like the sorts of behaviours that you would you would see if you were to simply observe a human behaving at home after they'd um, broken their leg. Uh, and that kind of touches on what I want to talk about, um, sort of move on to talk about, which is behavioural homeostasis. So how, do, how does behaviour control by these sorts of things? So... The concept of behavioural homeostasis is, is how is our, you know, how is behaviour modulated by, you know, important homeostatic needs. So when you think about homeostasis, most of you, if you've done biology A level or, or whatever, you know, um, 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 is part of your degree, you know, we think about, you know, insulin and glucose and thyroid physiological homeostasis so the things that the body does to correct changes um, and keep all the systems working um, according to their you know um, their kind of set points but a key a key the other key part of behavior of homeostasis is behavior so if you get cold for instance it's not just that you shiver um, but you also look you know you go inside you put a coat on you walk in front of the fire um, so synergistic with physiological homeostasis is behavioural homeostasis, and that's fundamentally concerned with, with motivation and, and, and drive, and, and indeed, as Bud Craig pointed out very um, articulately, it's, you know, this is where the sensation of, of in this example, ther thermal sensation is very closely tied with affect. Um, and, you know, when you think about it kind of in a sort of abstract way, he realizes that, that the fact that that affect is you know defines what rewards are and what punishments are and that kind of kind of opponency so if you have a homeostatic set point then punishments take you away from that set point at least beyond a certain level um, and rewards take you back um, back towards it and that's a simple way you could think about that in terms of food and water um, um, uh, so it's a relatively straightforward way and of course you can't just go on and on having punishments forever eventually death lies either side of those of those lines so you can see that the values are obviously going to be non-linear, you're going to have a very big rise as you get close to death and all sorts of things need to change. Now, there are many situations in, 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 in life when, um, um, where you get kind of fundamental physiological um, state changes. So that might be um, in animals, it might be during winter when there's very little food about or, when you, um, or in the summer when indeed things get very hot. Um, extreme temperatures and with all these things it might be um, in times of when animals move around they'll go long periods of time without proper sleep um, and but, you know whatever aspect of you know wh whichever one you choose to look at you're going to get a you get a set of um, physiological and, and behavioral changes so starvation you get reduced body temperature reduction of activity reduced reproductive activity and increased risk taking 
In illness, okay, touching on that previous example, you get fatigue, uh, reduced appetite, lowered mood, increased sleep and hyperalgesia and anxiety. And injuries, again, one of these, uh, an example of a type of um, state dependence state dependent anesthesia you have an injury um, and you get pain and hyper hyperprotective behavior as well as fatigue and lower mood anxiety and changes in appetite so it makes sense that that, that should be under some sort of control um, because they always seem to go together and we recognize that in chronic pain patients they often end up with fatigue and lower mood and so on now <clears throat> touching then on this concept of what is good pain and bad pain i mean we recognize that um, Chronic pain should be part of an adaptive physiological response. So it's, it, it, it obviously, if you've broken your leg, um, uh, you, know, you get home and you've had a got a plaster on or whatever, um, you need to not break that leg anymore. You need to protect, you need to look after yourself. Um, and the way that your behavior, the way that your brain will drive your behavior to look after yourself is tell you not to go out. So don't go and socialize, don't go um, to the disco, whatever, um, um, so you, and the way you do that is by reducing reward seeking, which is effectively lowering your mood. Um, you'll become much more um, uh, in, uh, sensitive to different punishments. That'll manifest as a kind of anxiety. You've got to not move around, conserve your energy. That will look like fatigue. You need to seek relief and, and so on. So the set of behaviours which you'd expect to get seem to map with the symptoms that we associate with, with, with pain. And if you have ever broken your leg, it, particularly you know, decent fractures, you'll recognise all those symptoms as being you know, as being normal. Alongside that, you'll get all the sorts of enhanced protective response in wound tending um, and kind of guarding um, um, uh, of that area. So all those sorts of behaviours seem to speak to an, um, an internal kind of homeostatic system, which is controlling our responses. I'm not going to say that much about how that might be organised, but we can, other than to say that we can build models of that. So we can understand how all these different incentives um, and homeostatic systems, multidimensional homeostatic systems, might interact to control those sorts of behaviour. Um, and that's what we're working on now, is trying to build those sorts of models which, which can reproduce that. Um, and that's important in the artificial control systems as well, where if you think about... Um, um, uh, safe modes and computers or default or, you know, uh, protective systems in in um, autonomous cars and uh, and so on. So it's really important to, to, to have a system for changing your behaviour if you've picked up some sort of damage. But particularly in biological systems in humans and animals where you can heal, you can actually get better on your own, you need the time to be able to do that. Um, 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 so, th so you kind of have to go through an enhanced safety period to, to get back to normal again. Um, so if you were Bud Craig and indeed there's a good argument to, to, to uh, you know, good case to be made that the insulin might be a, um, a well-placed brain hub uh, to control all of that. It sits there closely connected to areas like the hypothalamus, um, the anterior cingulate, and of course to, to cortical and medial prefrontal regions, as well as to the key brainstem sites, particularly the, P the PAG, but also the parabrachial nucleus is sort of emerging as a really exciting area in, in thinking about tonic pain signals. Um, if it is a control hub, then of course it's both acting as a, as a sensor, um, so access to multi-dimensional incoming signals which tell you everything you might need to know about pain, about injury, so not just pain but immune signals, um, inflammatory, sig yeah, inflammatory signals, other interoceptive signals and so on. But also then of course you need to do something about it, you need to control behaviour, um, um, through you know through net efferent networks um, which you know can actually have access to the sort of mesocortical systems which control mood um, anxiety and uh, um, and so on as well as controlling pain so the um, <clears throat> descending control system can descending control system can of course um, increase the value of pain to make yourself hyper protective um, of that area and other areas um, is that useful then for understanding chronic pain? Um, so we often then will think about chronic pain as being some sort of failure of that, that basic system. So some, some situation where the system has become over responsive. Um, <clears throat> what we can do is we can take um, chronic pain patients and we can give them the sorts of tasks that we use to generate those models in the first place. So the sorts of tasks we're doing in healthy people in the scanner uh, and give them to some patients. Um, and because we've got models of everything, we can quantify 
um, the way in which they behave, the parameters of their behavior in quite a complicated and sophisticated way. So it's in the same way as you might run a kind of cytokine panel, um, if you, I don't know, if you did that with your LPS study, but you get, you know, all the TNF alpha, IL-4, IL-6, everything like that. You can do kind of do the same with the parameters of behavior. And then you can run that against the, the, um, the, um, the symptoms or whatever you want to run it against um, uh, uh, that you get from the patient. What we find um, is that you see those sort of dark blue on the plot on the bottom left, um, you get a very high correlation between punishment sensitivity um, and also sort of behavioral um, other, other learning rate parameters that correlate very high with, with pain and, and also with, um, with fatigue. Um, so they seem to capture, it's a kind of very nice behavioral biomarker. So a kind of computational sig signature of, of symptoms in patients. Um, that, that works quite nicely. You can then try to map that. You can see whether that seems to correlate with insular activity. You can look at insular based networks and you can show that the centrality of the network, that is how important is the insular as a hub controlling those behaviors um, correlates very well with, um, with, those, with, the sort of, with those models. So it relates symptoms to punishment sensitivity to insular based networks. So it looks like it's, um, <clears throat> it looks like there's a kind of explanatory um, framework for understanding how you how um, uh, these kind of behavioral homeostatic control um, um, relates to actual uh, behavior in chronic pain. So as I'm going to end up now, just take this broader view on what we think really think about chronic pain as it's more of a disorder of behavioral homeostasis and purely a disorder of pain. Um, um, and indeed, if you come to the clinic, you'll often see all these things related to each other. So fatigue and apathy, anxiety. Um, we see this commonly in people with neurodevelopmental disorders, impulsivity and control and sleep, of course, and fatigue and circadian disorders. They all seem to coexist. And if you ask patients, you're often going to four or five different clinics for each of these different circles. You know, why have you got so many things wrong with you? They say, I don't have so many things wrong with you. We've got one problem. It's just that you guys seem, seem to find the need to split it up into five clinics. Um, and indeed, you know, we should believe them. There really is probably just one core problem here. Um, in many of these patients, and it relates to that core control of behaviour that you get, as if, as if the pain, you know, and indeed as, so for many of these patients, as if the brain thinks that they're injured, even though, when they are not. So driving all the types of things that you expect to see with injury, um, but it's just somehow made a mistake along the way. And we can kind of, ex we can propose why the pain system might be particularly sensitive to that sort of, um, making that sort of error. So I won't go into the details and I'll put a, site, a, 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 um, a link to a paper at the end, but we can think about w why it is that the responses to chronic pain seem to get, get in the way of your ability to realize that your injury might have got better. That's really just a computational reframing of, um, um, of things like the um, fear avoidance hypothesis. So the fear avoidance hypothesis captures something important about the about um, you know, why it is that someone with chronic pain might not get better um, because of the behaviours that they do to the pain in the first place. Um, so we can kind of cast that light of a, of a computational framework and kind of formalise it and indeed show that, um, that you'll actually end up with chronic pain um, by, you know, by, by simulating that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so I think and you can map that to the brain very nicely if you think about the control of behaviour I uh, say these meso mesocortical systems, mesolimbic systems, and dopamine, but as well as also to, to the neuropeptide systems in the hypothalamus. So neuropeptide Y, um, orexin, um, um, yeah, and many other, many other kind of um, um, hypothalamic neuropeptide systems um, um, you know, seem to be commonly involved in all these different sorts of behaviors. So erexin is involved in sleep, it's involved in pain, um, it's involved in um, appetite and things like that. So many of these systems seem to be, have multiple roles or seem to control multiple different aspects um, of behavior rather than just linked to one of those. Um, ultimately, the target of this is to try to develop technologies to treat pain. I mean, there are many ways of approaching pain in terms of behavioral treatments or drug treatments, um, but engineering type treatments obviously beget engineering type um, insights. So the, um, the, the goal of a new clinical neuroengineering is to design new technologies that essentially take 
what works well out of things like physio and CBT and embed them in more sophisticated technological frameworks that can capture things like or, or can use things like sensory motor training or chronotherapy or neuromodulation we can build integrated systems virtual reality of course um, <clears throat> peripheral stimulation uh, and so on so that's what's exciting now is that you know the fact that we've kind of reached a technological cusp where we can really build quite sophisticated integrated systems um, which offer a kind of drug three route um, to, to, to treatment which ought to be of benefit for many people again that's not trying to reinvent what we know works it's really trying to build on top of it um, and finally, we can also um, use this to build, as I say, completely artificial systems. So we can combine, we, we can kind of have deep learning versions of our pain systems and use them to control real robots. Um, and any type of control system where you need to be very safe. So that could be human centric systems. It could be very expensive robots or whatever. Um, so yes, to conclude, I mean, the key things is this is a view of pain which sees pain as information and it's a precise you know, it, it being processed in a precise learning and control system which tuned to maximize survival and which this sees pain as a um <clears throat> as a kind of control signal a prospective control signal which shapes our behavior i would argue that chronic pain is best conceptualized as a persistent internal model of the injury at least in um for things like what we consider no plastic pain that might not extend to every aspect of pain um, like neuropathic pain but it does seem to capture some types of chronic pain um, and in that context what you really see is a brain which thinks it's injured driving the normal physiological homeostatic responses or injury behaviors um, and my third point is that we can use neurotechnologies to exploit um, information rich strategies to target brain information processing so really trying to rewrite the kind of software problem that's driving pain in some of these people at the bottom there um i put a link i just mentioned a couple of review papers so if you're interested in any of that um those two papers kind of summarize pretty much everything i've said um today the one on the right is kind of more phasic pain the one on the left is more tonic pain that's it. Thanks to all my um, collaborators. And I shall move quickly on to the adverts, um, which is to say that we have um, an online course, um, which you can all do. It's completely free um, and it's accredited. So you get a whole big stack of CPD points if you do this. Um, and it's about 30. It is. Um, um, so this should be 28. Um, a half hour lecture so very easy you can um, you can sign up if you go to the cpnn website and you can most of them are online they're still being delivered every week but you can catch up with them all um they're nice uh, half hour lectures by lots of really great speakers this is just kirsty here um some many of you probably know kirsty um she's doing one on the um, um descending control systems um and yeah, it's a really great resource. There's little quiz questions and you can you can I say you can get a certificate at the end of that when you've done all that. So uh, um, um, over 400 people have signed up so far. So if you haven't, if you're not one of those people, then be one of those people. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.